Pacific this afternoon here in, in the Valley in Virginia. We're glad to have you with us. This is the last webinar of 2016, but we have a, a new line of webinars beginning in January. They're not on the web yet, but uh, you'll hear about them from Sarah at the end, and we will be posting them shortly. Uh, the topic today is one that really has interested me. I, I've been fascinated with the way various professionals have found ways to implement restorative justice within the framework of their of their jobs, of their professions, and lawyers particularly, because, you know, as we often say in restorative justice, the law isn't necessarily very friendly to restorative justice. And yet there's a group of, a growing group of lawyers, attorneys around the world who are finding ways to implement restorative justice within the practice of law. Some of those have been gathering every couple of years here in the in the valley to learn from each other and support each other and problem solve and so forth. And we're going to have two of those with us today. So I'm excited about that. So the topic today is restorative justice and the practice of law. And our guests are, first of all, Brenda Wall. Brenda is a private a practicing private attorney in West Virginia. She has an extensive background working on behalf of children, families, and consumers as both advocate and legal counsel. Uh, she previously worked with, the legal, with legal aid with West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, the West Virginia legislature, and the state bar. She's also been a prosecutor. Uh, she's not one now, but she's married to one. Uh, she has a law degree from West Virginia University Law School. She's a graduate of our program. Uh, she had been practicing law a long time when she came to our program. And then after she graduated, she and I had fun teaching what was really, I think, our first online course together. We had a lot of fun with that. The second guest is Susan Marcus. Susan comes uh, to us from New York City. You'll probably see the New York City in the background in her video. She's a criminal defense attorney in private practice in New York. She specializes in capital litigation. Uh, for those of you outside the country, that's death penalty uh, work and restorative lawyering. And she works primarily with violent cases involving trauma, brain damage, and mental illness. Her particular focus has been working not just with clients, but with clients, families, and communities to find ways to, to find restorative ways to solutions to arrest and punishment to, to resolve conflict and to address the underlying cause of crime. From 2001 to 2004, she was a public defender with the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem in New York. That's a community-based holistic defender office. Then in 2006, she returned there to develop a model for community-based responses to violent crime. Prior to becoming a defense lawyer, she was a mitigation investigator on death penalty cases. And she has a long history of working on death penalty cases. She's a member of a variety of just jurisdiction bars in a variety of just jurisdictions. We can't claim her as a graduate here at CJP, but she's been here for a number of trainings, including the Summer Peace Building Institute and our STAR trauma program. So Brenda and Susan, welcome. Uh, we're really glad to have you. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Our, Brenda has an art background, and one of the things I learned in teaching with her is that she can't stand having very many uh, uh, PowerPoints up without pictures on them. So, you know, you know I, I always enjoy that, see what's coming. So, uh, Brenda, I'm going to turn it over to you first, and then Susan will pick up. And again, if you have questions, put them in the in the Q and A section, and I will be monitoring that. And after they're done, I will be facilitating those questions. So welcome and take it from here. Thank you, Howard. I am very excited to be uh, joining you on uh, this topic that I'm passionate about. Um, I love restorative justice and I love practicing law. So bringing those two together is just terrific. So I'm excited to be able to share this. Let me put my screen up. My PowerPoint is not coming up, let me see. Here we go. Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to start um, then with uh, my PowerPoint. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes um, on a presentation on my work with, uh, with being a lawyer and bringing restorative justice into uh, my practice. Um, since 2008, I have worked to do that, and so this is kind of going to walk you through a little bit of that. I have been a lawyer since 1987. And in 2007, I decided that, uh, that the law wasn't really providing very good solutions to most of my clients, and I went back to school at Eastern Mennonite to attend um, the CJP program. I was really excited about restorative justice, happy to be studying with Howard and all the great students at, at EMU, and um, I always thought while I was there that I would graduate and pursue restorative justice full-time through a, a program or through um, being counseled to a program or something like that. But during my time at um, CJP, I kept hearing different pieces about restorative justice and mediation skills, and I would go back to my office and practice. And I realized that my own private practice that I had had since 2000 was a great lab to uh, experiment with um, and to, to try to find out ways to bring restorative justice and to bring peace building into an everyday practice of law. And so since that time, I've been working on that. I've also been working on a book that I keep revising that's kind of a that, that goes into some of the issues that we'll talk about today, and hopefully that will be complete next year. So how can uh, an everyday practice of law really be uh, restorative justice based? Remember that restorative justice is not a particular program, it's not a particular thing. Um, and in fact, both Howard and um, Dan Van Ness describe restorative justice as, as a continuum. And you can kind of take any type of process or judicial process and place it somewhere on that continuum to say that it's more or less restorative. So what I began doing is looking at different parts of my own work and saying, where is it on that continuum? This hearing I did today, is it far left? Uh, is it less restorative? Is it more restorative? And what can I do to move it to be more restorative? That interview I had with that client and her family, was that a restorative? Was that restorative or was it less restorative? Was I being um, very inquisitive and demanding with my questions, which would be less restorative? Or was I taking my time and letting her reveal her narrative to me slowly, which would be maybe more restorative? So I started using this continuum as a kind of a lens to look through each, each of the practices in my own work to figure out how to make it more restorative. In all cases, kind of looking at, well, where is the good? Where is the restorative here? What is it about this case that, that, that makes everyone's life better, that makes our community better, and how can that become bigger? So creating a restorative law practice, to me, um, is easy to explain through three different kinds of ways. One is pretty theoretical, which um, is, is the concept. What are the principles of restorative justice? What are the values of restorative justice? And how can I bring them into an everyday practice of law? Um, that's where we're going to start. Once we go through that, I'm going to kind of walk you through what a case might look like in my office when I'm trying to uh, implement a restorative justice-based process uh, with my cases. And the third thing is, is to kind of look about different substantive areas of law and how they can uh, incorporate restorative justice. Most of you are probably familiar with um, the principles of restorative justice. And when I went into that first RJ class in 2007, we started here. And for me, anytime I'm looking at anything that has to do with restorative justice, whether I'm thinking about a program or a course or one of my cases, I'm always rooted in the principles and the values. These principles are in Changing Lenses, and of course, you'll have access to the PowerPoint through the uh, recording to be able to look and learn more about the specific principles. Using these principles has changed my practice in a number of ways. And I think the two biggest ways would be, one, opening up the net and being more collaborative. My client and my client's family and the community become collaborators to, to the legal problem for us to try to work together to find a resolution. Uh, it used to be that I was really kind of focused on the client and it was just attorney client and that was it. And, and, and I didn't have a kind of a big broad uh, way of trying to look at my cases. And so now it's broader and we bring as many collaborators as we can to the table to work on the problem. The other really big, huge change is that when I'm looking at a legal problem, instead of looking at the rights and the duty and the breach, I'm looking more at what the harm was and what is the need that was created. Every time I meet with my clients, I'm really focusing on their, my clients' needs and how those needs are going to be met. The rights become secondary 
only in as much as they help me find a way to meet the needs. In addition to the uh, restorative justice principles that we were talking about, Howard also identifies these three critical values to restorative justice, and those are values that I bring to my practice and try to bring to every single case. And how they've changed my practice, um, I, I think the biggest way they, that these values, when I think about bringing them to my practice, the way it's really kind of changed is, is really this value about responsibility. I think when I was a new lawyer, um, and even before, all the way up to 2007, sometimes I would take on responsibility for things that weren't my responsibility. I often felt bad for the situation that, that, that the clients might bring into my office and um, feel like I had more responsibility to, to do something that I really don't have any control over. At the same time, I think lawyers tend to deny that we have a lot of responsibility over process. We don't have to file bean pleadings. We don't have to allege adultery in a divorce complaint. We don't have to file ridiculous discovery just to make the other side suffer. Um, we really need to take responsibility over the process and trying to be rooted in making that be as restorative as we can. And so I think that if I look at those values, this idea about responsibility is one big change that's happened within my practice. Skills. This change has required that we um, have different skills. Our advocacy skills that we got in law school and kind of refined through our litigation are helpful and I don't wanna dump them, but I need you, they need to be supplemented when we enter into this restorative practice. Um, where do you get these skills? Um, EMU has a great program and I'm really happy I went because I think the courses there really um, helped me obtain the skills that I needed to be able to go into this new kind of practice. I mean, the new practice, the type of listening that you need to do in a restorative practice is quite different from what we learned how to do in law school. You're not just listening for issue spotting. You're not just listening for holes in the story. You're listening to figure out what is this client's narrative? What's the client's story? What does the client need? And that requires a completely different type of skill. So EMU provides that type of training. I think that some mediation courses also help provide that type of training. So now I want to turn and look at something a little bit different, and we're going to go through, move out of kind of concept and into reality, just kind of um, look at how do I do this? What do I do day to day that is a different type of a practice by being restorative in the way I approach my practice? So it's kind of the, the nuts and bolts. And one of the things I like about this slide is that she's got this map out and this globe there. And I think that one of the foundations of my restorative practices is that when I meet and collaborate with my clients, we are always developing a plan. Um, I think that lawyers have a tendency to take a case and then respond to pleadings that are filed, respond to orders that are set, that set hearings. We just respond, respond, respond. And I think that in order to be uh, restorative, we have to be proactive and we have to be the ones that pull the map out and kind of figure out collaborating with our client exactly where we're going to go rather than just be responding. So the steps. The first step is, of course, before you ever even meet your client. And, um, and, and I think that that happens with, you, you've got, you know, I need to work about how do we answer the phone? Do we respond promptly? Are we respectful? Um, and then a real critical thing to me has been the way that the, uh, my office has changed as far as the environment. Prior to beginning to try to work restoratively, my office looked like a paper factory. There was photocopy machines and files everywhere and um, mail everywhere. And there was fluorescent lights overhead and the reception area wasn't a very inviting place. The conference room had a, a hard table and it just didn't feel like a place that you wanted to, to be at. It didn't feel like a place where you could sit and deliberate and contemplate and make good decisions. Um, and so I've reworked my office to try to create an environment where restorative activities can take place, where collaboration takes place, where people can feel like they can take their time to, to, to think about things and think about the questions that they have and the problems they have, rather than just generate more papers. Um, the quote here refers to uh, wilderness being a tonic, and I try to bring that into my office. It's like, what can we do to make there be more nature in the office? Because I feel like that really does help clients go into a different place than when they're sitting in a stuffy room with a lot of boxes of papers everywhere. So the restorative justice approach, the restorative approach starts before you meet the client. 
and it becomes really important at that first meeting. Um, and I, I think at the first meeting, the most important thing you're trying to do there is, it is to figure out the client's story. What's the client's narrative? And you're not just looking at it to try to figure out what you can prove in court, but you're trying to figure out what does the client need and where are they coming from? And, and, and our advocacy skills require us to kind of respond and say, yeah, that was terrible. That was bad. We got to put it to them. We've got to find a new way to respond that makes the client understand that we hear them and we understand them and uh, we care about them, but not that we dig this adversarial rut that's going to later be more difficult to uh, dig ourselves out of. Then as we continue, we continue to build the relationship. And um, as we, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There was one other thing I wanted, I wanted to mention about that first meeting. Critical to that first meeting is working with the client to create a way to stay in touch. Um, making sure that you're gonna have face-to-face -face meetings with that client to be able to build the relationship, making sure that you're gonna have telephone access or whatever you're gonna do, but make sure that you've created a plan with the client to stay in, in touch. Otherwise, the case tends to fall off the um, schedule, you miss it, and all of a sudden you're back into response mode and you need to stay in that proactive mode where um, the client's needs are always gonna be first uh, in, in being addressed. Um, and as we're building the relationship, I, I want to come back to that point about the stakeholders, too, because um, a lot of folks don't like to involve extended family or people that don't have legal standing uh, to participate in a case. Those folks have a lot of resources. And as you're building the relationship, if they can be part of that relationship building, they bring their resources to the table. And um, that collaboration becomes even more possible. And then we would talk about building a resolution. Um, we've, we've got the relationship with the client. They came to us because they had a legal problem. And so then we're going to collaborate to build the resolution. To me, the difference in how I approach that now with prior to when I was trying to incorporate restorative justice into my practice is to move away from the blaming and move away from creating a game, you know, with, uh, with discovery, creating a game with, with futile arguments with opposing counsel, really trying to figure out how we're going to build this resolution and how can we build a resolution that's going to meet the client's needs so what if it's all impossible the case is not going to settle you have a, a, a you have a factual situation which it just it's impossible to settle it's one of the five percent of cases that's actually going to go to trial do you just throw restorative justice out the door and just go ahead and uh, come in with your guns blazing I think that when the case is going to become adversarial, it's even more important that the restorative justice values guide what you do. Um, you know, I've heard Howard talk about how restorative justice is just common sense. And I think that when you're in litigation, uh, restorative justice is just common sense and it's not rocket science and it's not new age mumbo jumbo, but the values of restorative justice, such as respect and such as inclusion and such in safety and healing, when we can bring those to the adversarial process, it makes that process less destructive than it might be otherwise. You can minimize the damage of the, the uh, adversarial process by trying to make that process further, uh, less, more restorative on that continuum by bringing as many values as you can. Now, if you've got opposing counsel that's very difficult or a judge that's difficult, there's gonna be limits on what you can do but that doesn't mean that you can't try within whatever you've got to bring those values to that, to that process. So closing the case, um, you know, we have our, our legal way of closing cases and sending letters, um, but I think that it's also important that, that you keep that ongoing relationship with your clients. It's part of your community and it's, it's, part, of building that, um, it's part of building that restorative practice. And uh, my clients come back and visit and it's wonderful. I love to see it. I love to get graduation and wedding announcements. And so I think that you know, the case gets closed, but the client relationship uh, is sustained. I'm gonna turn now to uh, looking at restorative justice and how it might look in different kinds of uh, practices. Um, Susan has a criminal practice and I have primarily a civil practice. And so we're gonna look a little bit at that. But I want to caution you um, to think about substantive areas as, as too restrictive. I mean, because just because a client comes in with you to see you and they have a certain type of a problem and it's a certain type of substantive area doesn't mean that it's not broad enough to include other areas. Um, and 
I think I was talking to a guy from uh, Westlaw one day when he was trying to sell me some advertising and asking me about what kind of practice I had. And I said, you know, I really don't define my practice by the kinds of cases I take by the substance of law. It's by the processes that I use because that's where I feel I have um, my most that I'm best is with my processes that I use. And so that's kind of how I define my practice that I try to use restorative justice processes, collaborative processes, and mediation processes that are non-adversarial and that are win-win processes. So anyway, when you look at these substantive areas, I feel like they're kind of a, a convenience for the law and we shouldn't be restricted or bound by them. I do represent crime victims and um, the way I bring restorative justice to working with my crime victims is that when they come to see me, pretty much in West Virginia, I'm allowed to, to uh, prepare their crime victims compensation fund uh, application. And I do that. And as I do that, I start meeting the unmet needs of the client. I, help, I often help them navigate the process. I often help to, them to find a way to be heard. And um, sometimes some of them are interested in victim offender conferences. And if that's the case, I get in touch with defense counsel and we, we try to arrange for a victim offender conference. So with crime victims, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit, it's a good fit. Restorative justice can be a very good fit. I, I do want to add that it, with the crime victims compensation fund, um, I end up doing quite a bit of litigation in that area where they deny my, uh, my client's application and we have a hearing. And these are often cases that have not been prosecuted. The police don't believe they need to be prosecuted, but the victim is still suffering. And I have found that that hearing is often really important to the client. It's their only opportunity to be heard. So um, anyway, I just, that's a real passion I have. And I really feel like it's important to keep that as restorative as possible, making sure that that, that client's need to be heard is going to be able to be met. Um, child dependency cases can be a great fit for restorative justice. Um, family group decision-making models are used throughout um, the United States in um, some child dependency cases. Some of those are more restorative than others. Um, and so if your state does have that type of a, a family group decision-making model, you may want to work to make it more restorative in case it, it, it really is not um, adhering to the, the principles and values. If your state doesn't have a model like that, there is no reason that you can't um, try to bring in some of the elements of family group decision making into your own um, process. I do a lot of personal injury cases in uh, what they call civil litigation. And uh, those cases, those, those victims have the same kinds of needs a lot of times as crime victims. They have medical needs that need to be met. They need to tell their story. And they often want the other side to accept some type of a responsibility or, or apologize. Um, so a lot of times I can bring restorative looking processes to my personal injury cases. I have learned to do what I call selling my cases backwards, which means that when the client is well and ready to settle their case, I used to use some formulas and figure out, you know, how much damages they could get based on these formulas. Now I sit down with the client and say, since your accident, what about your life isn't right? Is there anything that you can think of that could happen to make your life feel better, like you're, you're getting what you need? And clients will normally have a goal. Um, I had a case not too long ago where a client had, um, had terrible problems with her teeth and she wanted to have that her dental issues addressed. That was not related in any way to the accident. But she said, you know, the accident caused me a lot of pain, but if I could get my, the situation with my teeth addressed, my life would be better than it was before the accident. I said, okay, great. So we worked up a budget. She went to the dentist, we got the budget together, and I actually was able to work with the insurance adjuster, and I told him what our goal was, and I feel like he became a partner in trying to help this client be able to get her, her work done on her, um, on her teeth. And so I call that settling a case backwards because we're figuring out how the money is going to be spent uh, before we settle the case. And I, I, I have really, really enjoyed being able to do that with my clients. I do family law and collaborative law is a very good fit with the restorative justice values. And I urge you to, to look into that further. And mediation, I do mediation and I also find most of the mediation work I do to be very consistent with my restorative justice principles and values. Um, additionally, by doing mediation, I feel like I'm getting a refresher course in conflict resolution skills that are not adversarial. And that's very helpful. I also, um, 
have been able to sometimes bring restorative justice processes into mediation. I've used some um, circle processes in, in some large mediations and it's been very successful. There's also applications for restorative justice practices with youthful offenders, and I'm gonna wait and let Susan address that one, and also with criminal defense. So that's my two cents worth. This is my contact information. Um, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions or if you're trying to start off and figuring out how to get your restorative justice private practice of law off the ground, I would, would love to talk with you. Thank you. All right, Susan. Susan, you need to um, unmute your mic. Okay. Good job. Um, I'm Susan Marcus um, from New York. Behind me, maybe just a half hour ago, was the beautiful sun setting, and now it's I'm five o'clock. It's already dark. Um, so thank you for having me and joining uh, Brenda, who um, does such wonderful work. I uh, have the opportunity to spend some seminars with her and learn about the work that she does. And she really did a wonderful job of laying out a lot of the principles um, in restorative lawyering. So I just want to give a couple of examples of how I've, how I've been a restorative lawyer in complex capital cases with adults, with people who have committed serious acts of violence. Um, oftentimes with people who are very mentally ill, um, them themselves or family members, um, to show that restorative lawyering is possible even in um, the more difficult cases. So um, so you know, what are some of the things that um, we can do to incorporate restorative lawyering in our criminal cases? Um, one of the things that we do in our capital cases, um, a lot of times in a criminal case, the focus is just on the individual harm. Right? What did the one, what did the defendant do? Um, and even in, if it's a restorative justice case, the focus is just on what can the defendant do to make it right. Um, in capital cases, because it, there's so much that goes into um, why a client is where they are, um, so much that goes into what we present as mitigation. Um, we end up talking a lot about not just the individual harm um, that our client may have committed, but what is the harm that was done to our client as well. Um, so in restorative justice, we talk about moving beyond the either or and being able to embrace both and. Um, embrace the complexity in cases and embrace that um, one person's tragedy doesn't have to dictate another's. So we focus also on remorse, um, not just pleading guilty. So what are the ways to work with somebody who's committed um, a serious act of violence around developing remorse, expressing remorse, um, also including the people who've been harmed. And I love what Brad said about expanding the notion of stakeholders. So certainly the person most directly impacted by the crime, um, but also understanding that so many more people are affected by what happened. Um, when we work restoratively in a context, um, our clients' crimes in capital cases are traumatizing for everyone. Um, for the prosecutor, for the jury, for us, for the judge, to hear about the things that have been committed. So understanding um, that our stakeholders are broader than um, just the defendant and the prosecutor, just the defendant and even the, the victim's family. Um, if it's appropriate, we can work towards reconciliation. Um, we can work towards reconciliation by having um, different people come to the witness stand and testify on behalf of our client. Um, we can work towards reconciliation. Sometimes it may be even more direct if people are uh, wanting to do that to have a circle process. Um, Trauma healing is so important. It's, it's a central focus of, of what we do um, and building community capacity uh, and awareness. So around 
So when we start a case, working with the community to um, be able to address better the harms that led to the crime in the first place um, and their, their capacity and their awareness to deal with it. Um, the first case I just want to tell you a little bit about um, is a capital case that I worked on. Um, the client was from Orange County, uh, but he was born in Vietnam. He was born March 31st, 1975 a month before the fall of Saigon. Um, these are pictures of what happened to his parents' village in Phan Thiet in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive. Um, and so talking with the jury, not just about the crimes that our client committed, but what was the context of his life, um, of his family's life, that led to how he ended up where he ended up. And talking with the jury was a San Jose jury, many of whom, um, you know, certainly knew about the Vietnam War um, or had family members who were veterans in the Vietnam War, but helping a community of Americans appreciate what was the impact of the Vietnam War on the Vietnamese um, and understanding our clients' family who were refugees even within Vietnam. They were Chinese Vietnamese. And so understanding the complexity of our client's story and who he was in the context of the case. Um, you know, understanding um, this was his family coming over in the airport in Hong Kong. So how the circumstances um, of war lead to a family who, um, and you know, our plan is on his grandfather's lap in the front um, on the left side of the picture. And how we start from here um, to how we end up, all the things that had happened to them to ending up in the United States um, to hear our client on the right and his grandfather in the middle. Um, how it got to the point where the grandfather, who was so um, beset by the multiple times in which he was a refugee, not just once um, coming to the U.S., but by the time he came to the U.S., it was the fourth time that he had been a refugee. And at that point, he was a broken man and took out everything on the client. Um, and our client at that point, so estranged and not able um, to have the love and affection that he had um, when he was just a little boy, to the point where he ended up uh, joining a gang and committing the eight murders and 17 armed robberies and three attempted murders that led him um, to be our client. Um, and how when he got to, when he was arrested for the crimes, um, he was somebody who could not bear the shame of what he had done and um, tried to kill himself within weeks of being arrested and nearly succeeded. He was in a coma for six weeks. Um, and this is him literally on the day he awoke from the coma being wheeled in on a, the gurney for his arraignment. Um, and how we transform, how the process transformed um, from here, and I'll skip ahead a little bit, um, to here, um, which is how he was by the time we got to penalty phase. Um, and so that process, the only way we were able to get um, from here to here um, to here was through using restorative justice. It was through a process um, of trauma healing, creating safety and connection and empowerment for everybody involved. Um, you know, working with, going back to his family. This is a family who had been through the war between China and Vietnam, um, who had fled to North Vietnam and were forced to leave there when the communists came in and lived in Phan Thiet and were subjected to the war, as you can see here, and had to flee. Um, the grandfather had very successful businesses, had to, his businesses were confiscated and they had to flee to Saigon. And of course, um, had to flee Saigon, ultimately went to the refugee camps and then came over um, and were refugees in Orange County in Vietnam. So this family, who at this point is still together, um, despite having been through 
uh, at this point, three different um, forced immigration, um, how they end up becoming broken um, and unable to support one. And so we worked in the course of being able to get the family um, able and willing to testify in the penalty phase on his behalf to work through the generations of trauma and disconnection and dislocation that they'd all felt. This was a family who, because of the many different migrations, they didn't even all speak the same language. Um, our client didn't even have a first language. Probably his best language was English. Um, he wasn't entirely fluent in English, um, but his uh, grandparents and his father primarily spoke Chinese, um, which he spoke very little of, and they did not speak English. Um, so how do we um, bring a restorative way through and understanding what is their narrative, as, as Brenda talks about, what is important to them, what matters to them, not just saying, you know, you have to do this um, in order to save your loved one's life, or our client at, at this point um, wanted no mitigation presented, um, very much wanted to die. So how do we work with him to have a sense of, to deal with the shame that he felt from having committed so much harm and giving him an opportunity to make amends, which was incredibly significant and important for him. Um, you know, working not just with the family, um, but also, you know, he sat through a penalty phase, he sat through, excuse me, a, a guilt phase in which he heard from all of the people who he ever wronged. Um, and it was incredibly powerful and important for him to be able to sit through that and hear about the harm that he had caused others. Um, and to hear about not just, not just from the family of the people he'd hurt, but also in the armed robberies and the clerks and tellers that he had scared, even though nobody was hurt, um, but just the people that he had scared by coming in with a gun and robbing a jewelry store or robbing um, a computer chip factory and how important it was for his healing to be able to sit through and listen to that. And then um, at the same time in the penalty phase for him to listen to all of the people who had harmed him. And so we brought people, um, not just his family and his grandfather, who was finally able to tell his grandson all that he had been carrying and the reasons why he why he had so much pain and what he ended up taking out, how he took out all of that pain on our client. And being able to express to our client on the witness stand his story, his narrative, who he was, what he went through, um, and that he, he knew, was aware of what our client had done and he forgave him. Um, and he apologized for him to him for the harm that he had caused him. And we did that with each and every witness. We had our client was a part of a, a, a big fight at one point when he was just in high school, which is a fight that ended up leading him to join a gang. And so we located the person who started that fight, who came to court to talk to our client about um, and the jury about what that fight was about and also to accept responsibility for his piece of what had happened um, and how he understood now that what he had done really left our client feeling scared and vulnerable. Um, we had different, um, we had a rival gang member come and talk with the jury and our client about the harm that he contributed to um, and the healing that he was able to have throughout his life that allowed him to um, rise above and move on and be able to um, have a different pathway than our client had. This person ended up getting their PhD and was quite successful. Um, but nonetheless came forward to tell the jury about how important it was that he be there for our client, even though they were a one-time rivals. He said, I recognize that that could have been me. Um, and had I not had the benefit of all of the things in my life that I'd had, I could be sitting where he's sitting. Um, and I'm here to tell the jury that in so many ways, don't, don't, just, um, don't just give me props for kind of having risen above it, but understand all the benefits that I got that he wasn't able to get. Um, we also brought in cousins, people who were his kind of early corruptors to talk about, again, the things that they had done that contributed to this. Um, we had a soldier 
um, was the person who took a U.S. soldier. He was actually the um, photographer of all of these pictures that we were able to show the jury, who talked about um, his perspective and how impotent he felt it, to be able to do something to really help the Vietnamese and how tragic it was um, when the U.S. left in 1975 and knowing what they were leaving behind to the Vietnamese there. And so how do we get, um, again, from here, right, using a trauma recovery model and the things that, like I said, um, that we incorporate trauma healing, right, creating safety for everybody in the courtroom and in the process, um, being people who are reliable and stable, being very careful about not flooding either our jury, our witnesses, our client, um, doing grounding exercises, inviting our, our process of meeting with everybody. You know, we didn't subpoena anybody to come to court against their will. If they didn't want to come, they didn't have to come. It was a process of inviting people into um, what we were doing. And if it if it worked for them, if it was something that they felt empowered to do, um, then we created a safe space for them to do this, to collaborate um, with everybody. This wasn't something that we went in and said, even though we know we have ethical obligations as capital attorneys to present mitigation, um, it really took a long process of collaborating with our client and his family um, and the witnesses to make sure that we were doing it in a way that was respectful of their narrative. Um, respecting boundaries. If there were things that people really um, didn't want us to touch upon, um, we would respect their boundaries, not, again, abdicating our responsibility, but there, there we found that it was actually quite easy to both defend our client in the best way that we wanted to and also um, engage in this um, very respectful trauma healing approach. Um, we very much called forth strength and resilience with everybody talking about the things that helped them through um, so that um, our client understood that there were things that in him that were also signs of resilience that we promoted. Um, you know, our, our witnesses really taught us, the, the lawyers and the jury, about resilience, about that people can recover um, from these very difficult experiences and that it was a process like this um, that allowed everybody to do something like that to heal. Um, we created connection. And so, again, from a family who literally didn't even speak the same language, to create new relationships and connection to promote healing. Um, and this is Grandpa now. This is what he looked like when he testified. And this is somebody who um, our client never thought would testify on his behalf, would never do anything to help him. Um, and he was so brave in talking, he was 90 years old at the time that he testified, talking with the jury for the very first time. These are stories that had never been shared in the family. Our client never knew what his grandfather went to. He had taken personally everything that his grandfather took out on him. And it was only once he was able to hear all that his grandfather had been carrying that he realized that... Um, he wasn't at fault for all the things that his grandfather had done. Um, we reached out also, it wasn't just in the context of um, his past, but also um, allowing for opportunities for connection and strength and healing and reconciliation, um, even within the jail. Our client um, was somebody who had a very hard time initially adjusting to the jail um, and had been, as I explained and committed a lot of harm um, when he was free. And he is somebody who became a peace builder in the jail and became somebody through the course of um, through the course of the proceedings pre-trial, um, who became somebody who was very much um, a force for peace in the jail. This is a picture of Andrew Lewis Martinez. Um, if anybody is aware, he was referred to um, in California, it was famous um, in the 90s and 2000s. He was um, known as the naked guy in Berkeley. He was mentally ill um, and didn't like to wear clothes and was often arrested um, for a myriad of things, um, but he, he's known as the naked guy. 
and he was in San Jose County Jail next to our clients um, and for petty offenses and he would get sent to the state hospital um, and then get released and commit another crime and come back to the county jail and he was um, housed next to our clients and so when he would leave he would write letters um, to our clients when he was in the state hospital they would write letters back and forth and then one time um, in 2006 he um, is back in the San, San Jose County Jail and um, our client is, is very close and attached to him and knows that he's mentally ill and there's one particularly difficult night that Andrew's having um, and on is desperately trying to get the attention of the guards um, because he knows that Andrew's having a very difficult time and he can't get the attention of the guards. He doesn't exactly know what's happening, but he senses that Andrew's not okay. And he doesn't get the attention of the guards and he wakes up the next morning and Andrew's killed himself. And um, he had a, um, An is, is a tremendous artist here. And he didn't know what to do with the grief that he had. And so he drew this beautiful picture of him um, and had um, himself and the other inmates who were on the tier um, who knew Andrew sign it um, if he could find our, uh, Andrew's mother. Um, and so On's note, um, I can read it if you can't read it. I send my deepest sympathies and condolences to all of Lewis's family and friends. I've known Lewis for years and here and had the luxury to be his friend and brother. He is soft-spoken, quiet, kind-hearted, generous, smart, and occasionally funny for those close to him. Lewis needed love and proper help and treatment. He didn't deserve to be locked up all day and punished for his illness. Lewis, you are a good friend and brother and will be missed. Rest in peace, my friend. P.S. We don't fear our own deaths as much as the death of those we love. And so um, in the course of um, his trial, we, we knew that this is hap had happened and we talked with Ann about this and didn't know how to find Lewis's mother. Um, it turned out that she got all of Lewis's belongings back from the state hospital when he died and saw all of these letters going back and forth between um, this inmate and her son. And she looked up the inmate on the internet and um, said, oh my God, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. I was horrified by all the crimes that he was accused of committing, um, but read the letters and said, was struck by, and this is what she testified to on the witness stand. She said, I was struck by how much love there was between this person and my son. And so I took a chance. I was desperate for information. I wanted to know what happened. And so I reached out and she said, and what I got back was stunning. I got back an eight page letter um, telling me about who my son was um, from this person who had committed all these horrible crimes. And um, I, again, was struck about just how much love was coming from such a dark place. And so she came to court to testify on Ann's behalf and um, begged the jury to see the goodness in Ann and how she said, I don't know how I would have been able to cope with the loss of my son um, had I not been able to have the information from this person. And it comforted me a great deal to know that this person um, was a friend to my son in the time that he was in jail and I couldn't be with him. Um, and so all of those things got us, again, from here to here. I mean, just a remarkable transformation in a human being. Um, and just, I'll tell a much shorter version, but another case, um, and just to highlight, this is a case where, um, another capital client, um, he is 19 years old in this picture. And at the point at which this picture is taken, he, um, he's living in Chamberino, New Mexico, um, which is, uh, there's no actual roads. Um, it's all dirt. Um, it's on the border of Mexico, very close to Juarez. And at the point at which this is taken, um, all of the adults in uh, his world get swept up in a federal drug bust. And so he has two children of his own. 
and there are two other children of his uncles who he is now the only person to take care of. So he's in the he has to care for four very young children as a 19-year-old himself. And he's in a community that has very little uh, possibility for jobs or resources. And he had, at that point, been avoiding drug trade um, and felt like he had no options. And so he finds himself selling drugs for somebody else who lives in the na neighborhood, um, a person who has ties to the cartels in Juarez. And over the course of what happens, the person um, who he is buying drugs from um, tells him that he's short. He owes him $10,000, which was not actually true, um, but tells him that he owes him money. And if he doesn't get him $10,000 by the next day, um, he's going to tell the cartels in Juarez that um, he's that Larry, our client, owed, owes them $10,000. And so um, through he and an, another person who he was selling drugs with um, in, a, in a drug adult stupor um, go to confront the person that they're selling drugs and end up killing him and his wife very brutally. And so we ended up um, speaking to the daughter um, of the woman who was killed. So she's the stepdaughter of the person who was selling drugs, and, and it was her biological mother who was also killed. And so we went and spoke with her, and, and when I showed up, um, she initially thought that I was a um, from the prosecution, from the Victim Witness Assistance Unit. And I said, no, um, I am not. I, I'm here on behalf of Larry. And I'm just here to see if there is anything you need. I'm not here to ask you for anything, um, but I'm here to see if there's anything you need. And she immediately um, started to cry and um, said, will you please wait right here? I've been thinking so much about Larry because I remember that moment when um, all of the adults around him got arrested and he had to care for those four young children. And I knew the moment at which he signed up with my stepfather that he was going to be in a terrible situation because my stepfather um, raped me. He raped my younger sister. And he was in a very, very um, terrible, he had done very terrible things to myself and to my family. And I felt so bad for Larry. Um, and I knew nothing good was going to come of it. And so she wrote um, this letter to him. Um, while I was standing there. Um, I hope you are doing good. We are all good, thank God. So I don't know what to say. What you did was wrong, but I forgive you. I try to think that you went through a lot when you were a child, but I know and hope that deep in your heart you are a good person. I also know, I also hope and pray that you can live long so that you get to see your children grow. My mom didn't get a chance to see us grow, but God has a purpose for everything. Maybe he let this happen so that you could go through all these and for you to seek for him. I encourage you to read the Bible and ask him for forgiveness. Everybody deserves a second chance because God loves us. I pray that your family is okay and that they get to see you for a long time, even if it's in jail, um, but alive. I cannot hate you, and I hope you don't hate nobody. That only eats your soul. Pray like I will be praying so that the jury can see that there is a good person inside you. I hope that you regret what you did. Well, take care, and like, like I say, I forgive you because nobody to judge. People only, God, know what he wants for us. Take care, and my brother, Rita Berto, forgives you, too. Hopefully, all the jury gets to see that not because you did what you did, you are going to do it again. They have to know that when you do drugs, you get a different personality. Well, that's all I can say, and just think about your kids and family. And I do believe in miracles, and God does exist. Take care, and pray to God for forgiveness. Miracles do happen, you've seen them. Um, so she ended up coming to court to testify on his behalf, and she wasn't able to tell. Uh, the legal process really restricted 
a lot of the information that she was allowed to give on his behalf. So kind of the background of who her father was and um, wasn't allowed to come out. But what was so important um, to her to be able to do um, was to be able, and she wasn't able to read this letter, you know, none of that was actually legally relevant. Um, but it was important for her to be able to um, show him and his family that she forgave them. And by the act of testifying um, to some, if not everything, was so critical. And then what she did at the end of her testimony, um, because what really motivated her was not just the situation she understood him to be in, but also um, his children, those children. And so after her testimony, she then sat next to his siblings who were depicted here in the picture and listened the person after her, uh, or the, I should say the four people after her who testified were the children who Larry had to take care of who are now grown. Um, and so she sat and cried with his sibling um, listening to the testimony of his children. And so it was so valuable if we had not approached it in a restorative way, if we had been tied to kind of, um, uh, or being um, tied to some type of outcome, if I had approached her in any other way other than simply just um, asking her about her needs and not asking for anything, this what she ended up doing was entirely at her direction um, and nothing that we asked. It was something that she articulated she wanted to do. Um, I will stop there and I think we can go on to questions. Thank you, Susan. Well, this is exciting stuff. Uh, exciting and inspiring. We have questions and so I'm going to move to them right away. Uh, one of them, I'm going to start with a very specific question for Susan, uh, and then we'll move to more general ones. And Jeff asked, Susan, how in the heck did you get a judge to allow the extensive mitigation case you presented? Have you ever had that leeway in a non-capital case? Um, so, I, yes. Um, you know, in the course of, this is all what's required. Um, in capital cases, it's required in our ethical guidelines. So building rapport with witnesses. Um, under, you know, the time it takes in order to um, get beyond the barriers to disclosure that so many people have and working with people with severe, with severe trauma histories and mental illness, um, the community has done a really wonderful job of educating judges about all that's required. Um, you know, I will say we do a lot of this work um, without being able to build for it. Um, and without being able to, um, you know, a lot of what we do, we just do because it's the right thing to do. Um, and there have been times where judges will push back and say, you're spending too much time with the witness. Um, we just simply still do it because it's the right thing to do and the right way to be. In my non-capital cases, again, um, you know, these are practicing in a way that is restorative. You know, we need to investigate cases and develop witnesses and I do sentencing memos in my federal cases that are quite extensive and lengthy. Um, the process of preparing a witness, it's no different if you do it in a restorative way, I, I should say in terms of time, right? So um, doing, it's just how you do it, but we, it's built into what we are supposed to be doing as lawyers, which is identifying findings, developing witnesses, preparing them for whatever stage in the proceeding you need. So it's very much a part of what we do. And yes, there are judges who think we take too long. Um, and again, we just do it anyway. Okay, um, you raised a question that somebody else has raised here and I'm gonna turn, uh, uh, first of all, to Brenda, and then Susan, you may want to answer too. Aaron says, I'm curious about the fee structures for restorative justice-based legal work. It's so hard for me to charge folks who I know have limited funds for services and representation desperately need, what happens when you have low income and indigent, indigent I can't talk today, clients? Uh, Brenda, you want to pick that up first? Well, mostly I just go digging all the time. Um, whenever I, wherever we can go find funds, we go find them. Let's start first when, I, when I'm representing a crime victim. In West Virginia, um, crime victims have a right to have an attorney fill out their crime victim's application for uh, compensation. 
The Crime Victims Fund can deny compensation because someone didn't cooperate with the police or, or something of that nature. So when I'm representing a crime victim and I file that application, I often do a lot of other things that are very much uh, consistent with restorative justice to meet the needs of the victim, and the Crime Victims Fund usually covers those. Some states don't allow that to happen, but in West Virginia, I can do that. With my personal injury cases, I take those on a contingency fee, and so whether the, the people have money to pay for an attorney or not, it doesn't matter. Um, if we're looking at a specific restorative justice process, um, uh, that's what I really go digging. I mean, can we get public defender services to pay for a uh, victim offender conference? Is that, is that possible? Can we get um, the judge to order the DHHR to pay for a facilitator for a family group decision-making conference? And so it's just, where, where could the money possibly come from and what do we need to do to generate it? And when I can't find it, then yes, I end up doing some work pro bono or I beg my friends, um, there's, I know that there have been some on the, on, the, uh, on the call here today who I've begged to facilitate victim offender conferences because we didn't have any funding for those. So it's just a matter of, of trying to look as hard as we can to find resources and to keep pushing. And when it's denied, when the judge denies to pay for a facilitator for a family group decision-making conference, then try, just keep trying. And then when the resolutions um, are not forthcoming, maybe the judges realize that they have, they have to put this money out there to be able to, to get good resolutions for the families. Uh, the other thing I would say with my family cases is that they do pay me by the hour for those cases, but by doing uh, restorative justice-based processes, and I, I think that, that we save money in the long run because we're trying to address the client's needs at the front end, and they're not just laying there, not being addressed, and coming back later on um, and, and fueling more litigation. Because um, that's, that's what happens when you have a conflict that's not really being addressed, when a client has a need that's not being addressed, it's not going to go away. And if we can bring that need to the surface and address it, we're more likely to be able to generate a, re, a, a response to the conflict that the client's going to be able to live with rather than some prolonged litigation that's going to be very expensive. And again, I find that this is... Um in the way I, I practice. So all the things that um, a judge or somebody would pay me to do, it's simply a, a, com a different conversation that I'm having. So it's not additional things that somebody wouldn't necessarily pay for, but this is in the course of, again, meeting with client, explaining them about what the case is about, um, meeting with witnesses, developing witnesses, preparing them in for whatever stage that we need to. Um, so it's very much part of what I do. It's just I do it in a restorative way. Okay. Well, here's another question that seems kind of flowing from that one. So Prita asks, how do you attract clients in civil cases to restorative justice? Do you attract them through a traditional model and then bring in restorative principles in serving them? Or are you successful in communicating the value of restorative justice in order to attract clients in the first place? Either one of you? I don't think that most of my civil clients would even know what restorative justice is. Um, because it's not like, it's not a, it's not a handbook that I have, or it's not a, an advertisement I have. It's just the way I practice. And so when the client comes in and they're saying that, that, that I have this injury, that, that somebody ran a stop sign and I have this injury and I need to go to the doctor. Um, I'm not saying, Oh wow! They hit you. Well, they smashed you. We're gonna really cash in on this. We're gonna we're gonna go file suit and we're gonna have a big jury trial. We're gonna do this. I'm saying, wow, you were hurt. You know, what do we need to do so that you're feeling better? And are you getting the medical care you need? And and how is that getting paid for? And so it's it's the, the restorative approach is so um, interwoven in what I'm doing that it would be impossible to to kind of pull it apart and act like that is something that that I'd be using to to sell my practice. Um, I agree. I don't advertise particularly um, with restorative justice. It is just how I practice. Um, you know, oftentimes I will get calls. Um, you know, I do mostly court appointed work. So it's most of my work comes through, you know, in the traditional system. Sometimes I will get calls usually of friends of friends. Um, and it will be, you know, so then 
it's kind of a more open-ended situation of how would you like to handle this? There hasn't been a legal process initiated yet. Um, a lot of times in my criminal cases, by the time I meet them, they're already on the defense, right? So there's already been an arrest and, and there's a prosecution happening. Um, but there are times that when I just get a call, I have the conversation that Brenda's having of, you know, what is it that you need? How do we address this? Okay, and Deborah says, thank you for your presentation. It's very moving. However, when you involve people who do not have legal standing, how do you work through issues of confidentiality and conflict of interest? Um, what kinds of people don't have legal standing? You mean like not the defendant? I, I don't know. I mean, you were bringing in various family members and so forth. So maybe they're thinking of that. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, you know, it's not something that we're required to disclose if we're, um, you know, obviously if somebody comes and testifies on the witness stand, then, then what they say is public. And so, you know, so a lot of what our process is, is with people who are coming to court to testify is getting over reluctance to share what they say publicly. Some of our cases are in the media um, and it can be a daunting thing to kind of have to talk about these really vulnerable things. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's not a, well, we're just talking with witnesses. We're just doing kind of what you would do in a regular case, which is investigating and um, trying to see what it is people may say. That's not something that we have to, as the defense, disclose in, unless we're going to use it. And Howard, I, I think I, I would look at that question in two ways. Um, one way is, what about attorney-client confidence and if the client wants to disclose something that they want to be protected? Um, of course, when I have a meeting with the family or, you know, extra friends or neighbors, whoever comes in with the client, I explain attorney-client privilege to them and I let them know that if they make any disclosures with third parties present, that that, that, that communication will no longer be confidential. Um, and we talk about that for a while to make sure that they understand it, but mostly what they really want is their friend there to help them figure out what I'm talking about. Because, you know, a lot of times when people come to my office, and if we're going to talk about legal stuff, they may get confused and they like having that, that support there. They, and, and, and again, they're bringing resources to the table. These are their neighbors, their family members. They're the ones that are taking care of them when they're sick, when they're having um, mental health issues. And so these are folks at the table that are, are, are bringing resources to the table. So it's not so much that I'm asking the client to, give me a lot of facts. This is a collaborative meeting, but I do think it's important that the client understand that the attorney client confidence is not going to apply if third parties hear the communication. The other thing I just really want to emphasize is that I feel like that we lawyers are always acting like the case is going to be tried and we're going to be subpoenaed. You know, that if, that if this happens, so-and-so is going to subpoena you and you're going to have to testify. We have to remember that very few cases go to trial. And it's really um, a little bit paranoid to go through the entire course of every single case, assuming it's going to go to trial, when it's just not going to happen. And so I think that there has to be a balance there from that kind of paranoia about the case going to trial to really being able to, to sit down at the table and work out an agreement or work out, just work out resolutions, work out ideas and collaborate to be able to resolve what the conflict is. Okay, Aaron asked uh, whether you have any experience of working with clients who are innocent or not guilty and convicted from uh, the perspective of the inmate needing restorative justice from the system, people who are angered and traumatized at the unfairness of the system. Uh, yes, um, you know, and a lot of times, um, you know, somebody may, be respond I may have them on one case where maybe they're guilty and maybe they have other situations or other cases in which they're not. Um, you know, I have a fair amount of cases, my non-capital cases, um, with young clients who are um, targets of police harassment in New York City. And so um, we may also bring a 1983 case in order to um, create a process um that would vindicate what they have been through in that setting and even in that process you know beginning the conversation about how do we make this more restorative 
Um, you know, I've gone to precincts to try and talk with the police officers who keep arresting my clients. Um, it, it's all based upon what the client wants, what they feel. You know, I say, what is it, what is it that you would like? Would you like it to stop? Would you like compensation? Um, and then talking with different people in the system about, you know, how do we do something to get this to stop with this particular client? Um, and then I do a lot of community work around that too, to involve the church, parents, friends, um, talking with different people about how do we collectively respond and do something constructive um, to address, you know, in my community in New York, um, you know, the stop and frisk that was declared unconstitutional, but still very much happening and very much going on in my clients' lives. So it depends on what the case is, but, but absolutely, um, there's a myriad of ways to address it. Okay. Uh, Ted asked a question that I think you've partly answered, but it, it's clear to me how restorative work can inform the preparation and planning stages with a client. But can you describe more, perhaps with an example, how the restorative dimensions get worked out in the actual trial and courtroom context? Susan, I think to some extent you've answered that, but does either of you have more to say about that? How does it play out in the courtroom uh, in the trial? Um, you know, for for on the information coming in, um, and you know, it was initially something that you know, he didn't want to come in. He was incredibly embarrassed about it. He didn't want us to bother family. Um, and so the whole process of preparing him and getting him ready um, to be able to listen to the evidence and um, you know, not, he had a state court trial before we met him where he absented himself entirely from the trial. Um, wouldn't give his attorney any names, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cooperate with the mitigation. Um, and so it was a very long process of using a restorative justice approach, um, you know, of understanding what his needs were, right? As Brenda says, what's his narrative? What's important to him? What matters to him? Um, and how did, and we worked through a lot of trauma healing with him. For him, it was a question of really, you know, I think we had real concerns about his competency when we first met him. Um, and so that may have been the legal framework um, that made it relevant what we were doing. Um, but we had real concerns about his ability to assist us in his own defense and thought, um, you know, the prior attorney who didn't do all of these things um, didn't work in a restorative way and have went to trial with an incompetent client. Um, so it was so important for us and it was literally a matter of life and death that we had to do it this way. It wasn't going to work any other way. Um, and I think that's what I find in my cases is, is that a restorative approach is often kind of the only way through. Um, the other ways just, you know, you're, you're butting your heads up against the wall and you're not getting anywhere and, you know, you end up kind of bearing witness to these horrible outcomes. But when you work in a restorative way, um, it's the only way through. So I would say, too, that, that I think that when you have, a, especially since most of my work is, uh, a lot of my work is civil, my cases are so much less likely to get to trial. Um, and, you know, and I was thinking about one case when, you, when I read that question where um, it involved a life insurance um, policy where the, the insurance company had refused to pay it after somebody had lost a loved one. And they had really suffered a lot because they weren't able to make their mortgage payments and their credit suffered. And they were really pissed off about the insurance company and the company that, that the uh, decedent had worked for, that they would treat him so bad. And I think that if we had approached this case in a more conventional way, we would have ended up in trial because my client really did want his, he wanted his day in court. He wanted somebody to accept responsibility for causing him to have more pain after he had lost a loved one. But, but we had worked restoratively. We'd worked with needs a lot. And um, when we were in mediation, you know, the, the, the subject of apology came up and what if, the company apologized. What would happen then? What if the company said, this will not happen to anybody else and here's how we're gonna prove that to you? And he said, well, let's see how that goes. Well, that's what happened next and that case was resolved. Um, 
I mean, you know, the, the, that case was resolved be, because the company accepted the responsibility for their wrongdoing and they did it in a very articulate and meaningful way for this client. I feel like approaching this case without restorative justice values um, and principles in place would have led to litigation. and There would have been no other way around it because that uh, apology wouldn't have been there. Um, and I also think that whenever you're working with the opposing party and opposing counsel in a more collaborative way, that those relationships are always going to be better. And so that even when you are in litigation, the relationships are stronger and better. And um, another case that came to mind was a, a collaborative law case I did. And my client had really harmed his, his spouse by us with another relationship. And she was really quite devastated by it. So we did this case as a collaborative case. And um, in West Virginia, we still had to go to do a final hearing. The uh, woman had been the petitioner in that case, and so she was the one that was going to have to testify about everything to lay the groundwork for the judge to decide whether or not to accept the party's agreement. We got to court, and she was really, really, really upset. She was just doing terribly. And so I approached her and her attorney and said, I know that you're supposed to go first, but would you be, it'd be helpful to you if we went first, and you could just say that you agreed with, with my client's answers. And she said, oh, yes, I need that. I can't talk. And so because we had used the restorative justice approach, the collaboration up through that point, we still have that type of a relationship where I can make that offer and it can be accepted. So I just think it just changes all the dynamics so much that, that, that that's, that's part of the answer to that question. We're getting close to the end. We have a couple of questions yet, but a whole other area that you've touched on would be how you work with victims in a in the courtroom, in the trial, and how that would change with restorative justice. I don't know if you want to add anything on that yet before I move on to these last two questions. As I think Susan would probably be better at answering that question. Or um, So it, I always make a point in every case I have to, to reach out in some way that is restorative to whoever's harmed um, by my client's actions. And I would say I don't just limit it to whoever the victim on the complaint is. I also acknowledge in family situations um, the toll that whatever the crime has taken on them um, and reach out and see what are their needs and how can I help support the family. Um, you know, a lot of times my clients have intellectual disability, major mental illness, brain damage, trauma, um, that's gone unaddressed and not dealt with. And so the families have been living with a client who um, in some cases may have been re wreaking havoc on them as well. So, you know, this idea of a broader notion of stakeholders and of people affected by the crime, um, I'm always concerned. You know, ultimately it's relevant for the legal case because I want my client to be successful if they're out of jail or I want my client, you know, I want them to not have any new arrests or, you um, or if they get a probationary sentence or if they're unsupervised to release or something, I want to make sure that it's going well and it's smooth and I'm resourcing them ahead of time. But, you know, I think it comes from having a restorative frame. If I'm in the courtroom and it's a uh, families in a capital case and, um, you know, at the very least, I make it a point to approach them. Um, you know, I don't, I don't let an opportunity go by if I happen to be in the courtroom with the families during a pretrial hearing or something. And, and all I say is, you know, I just want you to know I'm very sorry for your loss. And I, I don't want anything, you know, nothing that I'm doing in the course of this is meant to denigrate the memory of your loved one. Um, please let me know if there is anything I'm doing um, that is upsetting to you because I want you to know um, that everyone here is sorry for your loss. This, you know, there's, can often feel very adversarial. I don't want you to feel that way. Um, I don't want you to feel that anybody here is against you. Um, and, you know, it has been met with varying degrees of um, reactions. It can, you know, I've gotten an angry reaction back and I've gotten a blank reaction back and I've gotten a really positive reaction back. And it doesn't matter to me um, I'm not there to control the outcome of that or try to manipulate them in any way. But whatever I can do to just acknowledge, um, and I just try to acknowledge it, and then they will control the whether there's an opening created after that. So, Thank you. The questions are now more getting more substantive questions coming in, so we may not get through them all, but 
But Kelly asked early on, have either of you found a greater awareness or understanding of restorative justice principles and processes by others, such as opposing attorneys, judges over time? What's the best avenue to expand awareness within the legal community? Um, a, a little bit. I think like I've raised it in cases um, to do kind of more formally like, hey, um, we have this case, why don't, why don't we do restorative justice? And um, it's been, there's been a shocking amount of resistance, um, at least in New York, in the, in the criminal context, doing it formally. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it is. Um, and so I think that's why I've gone back and, and it's, I just kind of do it anyway, as opposed to calling it that because everybody has different, you know, there's different associations with it. And um, sometimes it's positive, but sometimes it's seen as letting my client off easy or, um, or something that um, people just don't understand and think, you know, what do you mean that I don't have the ultimate say over what happens? I want to keep control over what happens. So um, I find that just by doing it and building it into the process and working collaboratively with opposing counsel, like Brenda's talking, um, you know, talking with the judges ab about this process, not calling it a name, but just actually doing it. And I had a case where a judge, you know, we, it was a kind of, we were fighting about things. Um, this was a client with a 61 IQ. And ultimately, the judge, um, you know, basically, the, the end result's kind of too long of a story to explain, but the end result was, in a criminal case um, where my client shot a gun into a, a crowd of people, nobody was hurt, um, but certainly a very alarming crime, um, sat down uh, with the judge who had grown up um, near the park where that had happened, um, talked with our client about the impact on her of the crime, um, and then heard for my client what it was he needed um, to be well. And as a result of this, the probation was kind of forcing a treatment alternative. Everybody thought they were being nice, but they were forcing a treatment alternative on him that um, felt pretty alienating and scary for him as somebody with a 61 IQ. And so she created an avenue to literally like come off the bench, sit at a table. We sat in circle um, and they listened to each other about what their needs were. And we developed a collaborative process um, as a result of that moving forward. And then she appointed me post sentence, which is kind of unheard of, um, to continue to be part of his treatment plan. So we meet um, every couple of months as a group with the probation officer and his treatment advisor, his family, him, anybody who has a stake in what's going on with him to talk about what are his needs, how's he doing, um, what are the needs of others in, in his family. Um, so we've created a restorative process without calling it that. Ed, do you have anything quick to say here, Ed? I think that it does move really, everything moves quite slowly. And I do think that, that there's two different things happening. One is when we're talking about let's have a restorative process and, and going to court and calling it that. And then there, there's the other thing about just living the values and the principles. And um, I, I brought this attorney in to be co-counsel with me on a case we met with our client about two weeks ago and I've done a few other cases with him. And he's been very conventional up until this point. And um, I did a transformative mediation with him and he was very curious about, about all of this, but it was just amazing because during this client interview, he was so different. I mean, the interview took an hour and a half, almost two hours. And I couldn't believe that he had the patience to just work with this client and listen to the client and listen to the client articulate his needs. When I walked out of that meeting, he said, you know, you really taught me a lot about how to talk with clients. And I was like, wow. I mean, that's, it, that is so small and it's so big at the same time. And so I think when I get discouraged, I have to remember that, that sometimes something is so small, but so big. Here's an attorney that just learned after 15 years, a new way to talk, to, to listen to clients. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's encouraging. <laughs> We're, we got some really good substantive questions that we're not we're going to have to close. I really hate that. But but one person is asking, Susan, what happened to those two capital cases? What were the outcomes? What were the sentences? Um, the outcome was life. 
in both cases. Um, and I will say, um, particularly in the first case that I talked about where we were able to do um, such a significant and really thorough job of kind of, it was restorative justice on so many fronts. Um, and, and the crimes were particularly traumatizing for everyone. You know, the judge in his sentencing remarks said he'd never in all of his years on the bench um, presided over a case where one individual had committed so much harm. Um, and so I think the process of what we did was healing, you know, we've since spoken with the jury, we spoke with them all afterwards. Um, and that it was really the process of doing what we did and how we did it was really healing for the jury. Um, I think if we had not done all of that, um, we probably would have had a different outcome. I always say a death verdict is a trauma response. Um, and so doing restorative justice, which to me, and the, the reason I come to this work is because it's so much about healing, um, is what led to the life verdicts in the case. Which is a good place to end, although I, again, I sure wish I, I would love to hear your answer to the questions that we're not going to get to, but, but through our time is, is, is coming to an end. So thank you both very much, a very inspiring and, uh, and, and really helpful webinar. We may have to do a follow-up one or something to get all these questions in. Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about what's coming, and then I'll come back and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for the fantastic webinar. It was, it was exciting to listen to. Um, so I have a few announcements here, but to begin to introduce myself, my name is Sarah King, and I'm a graduate student at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding here in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I work as the graduate assistant for the Zare Institute, and I have a couple of announcements to share with all of you, as Howard had mentioned. Um, so to begin, the spring 2017 webinar series was recently finalized, and its theme will be Building Bridges from Margins to Center. Each webinar will feed into the theme of the June 2017 National Conference on Community and Restorative Justice, which will be held in Oakland, California. As in the past, all webinars will take place on Wednesdays from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So then a brief overview of each of the webinars that we have going on. In January, um, we have Social Justice in Circles, How Are Circle Keepers Addressing Systems of Oppression, which will be hosted by Dr. Johanna Turner. In February, we have Transformative Justice, and Johanna will be hosting that one as well. And just a note, there is a link at the bottom of each slide. Um, feel free to go there to register for webinars, and I think that should be up within the next week. Um, and in March, we have Community Justice Partnerships, which will be hosted by Dr. Carl Stoffer. And then the last one will be in April, called Mapping a Movement, which will be um, hosted by Howard and Carl, I believe. So that is our spring series. So we're looking forward to seeing people um, registering for those and participating in the conversation. And then we also have the Summer Peace Building Institute coming up. It's not too early to sign up for that. And um, so it takes place during summer 12, 2017. SPI is a four week intensive during May and June offering 20 different courses. If you're interested in taking an intensive course on restorative justice, here are three of the options available during the curriculum. All of the course options are available online besides the RJ one. So please feel free to go and take a look and see what interests you. And then next we have STAR, which stands for Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. It is a research-based training program that brings together theory and practices from neurobiology, conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, and restorative justice to address the needs of trauma-impacted individuals and communities. This program is designed for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. There are several opportunities to receive STAR training, which you can see on your screen here. Currently, there are four level one sessions um, being held in either Virginia or Pennsylvania, and two level two trainings both being held here at Eastern Mennonite University in Virginia. If you're interested in participating or have any questions, more information can be found online. We also have a graduate certificate in restorative justice. Um, the certificate is 18 credit hours with equal focus given to conflict analysis and practice, restorative justice studies and electives which could focus on any number of things that might interest you. Um, the certificate can be completed through a number of courses offered through the annual Summer Peace Building Institute or through a combination of one semester on campus and one summer term. 
And then we also have restorative justice and education. So there are two opportunities for this. You, there is a master's in education program that has a restorative justice and education concentration. And there's also a restorative justice and education graduate certificate, which is a 15 hour certificate program for those who are looking to specialize in RJ within an educative setting. And we also have master's programs in conflict transformation and a brand new one in restorative justice. And um, so let's see here. The uh, master's in restorative justice just started and this fall marks the beginning of it being offered. And the curriculum is practice-based and ideal for individuals looking to be reflective practitioners within their chosen field. And last but not least, um, we have the Zare Institute website, which is available as a source for upcoming events, resources, the schedule for upcoming webinars, and a repository for past webinars that are linked to YouTube. The recording for tonight's webinar will be available early next week. So that concludes my announcements. So here is Howard with a few closing comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And again, uh, Brenda and Susan, thank you so much for doing this. I think I think it is such a such a promising area of, of application. And thank you to all those of you who joined us. We had a, a large group here today. Uh, and it, I think there'll be a large number of people looking at the webinar later as well. Uh, we will try to have some have this up as soon as possible, and you, those of you who are signed up, will receive a link for it. So thank you. Have a good evening. I see that uh, Susan and Brenda have sent their webinar, their I'm sorry, their email addresses out on the chat box, and so it sounds like they're available within reason for consultation. So thank you for that. So uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we'll hope we'll see you next month on our next set of webinars. Uh, good night.